Hi everyone, and welcome to episode five of Fast Lead Basics. If you're just beginning with Fast Lead, I recommend that you start at the beginning of the Fast Lead Basics playlist, or the rest of this video won't make much sense. Although this is a basics episode, we'll be looking at some slightly more advanced techniques here, so don't worry if you don't understand all of it. The examples, which are available on GitHub as always, are written so you can just use them without completely understanding what's going on. Now I'm not an expert in C, uh, far from it in fact, so there are almost certainly more correct ways of implementing the following ideas. If you are an expert in C, uh, please feel free to point these out, uh, point out all the stupid errors I've made, or better ways of doing things uh, in the comments below. That being said, these techniques have worked for me, so hopefully they can also work for you. In this episode, we'll be looking at uh, writing patterns as functions in the same sketch and using a timer or a button to switch between them, crossfading between patterns via button or switch, and specifying patterns as classes, so they're only consuming RAM when they're active. Uh, this is useful if you have large patterns uh, with a number of variables or functions each. So let's get started then with writing multiple patterns in the same sketch. We'll begin by setting up some code to play three patterns on loop, uh, with each pattern playing for five seconds before moving on to the next. At the top here, I have pattern counter, uh, which is set to zero, which keeps track of which pattern we're currently showing. Then we get into our loop function. So we use a switch statement here uh, to look at pattern counter and run whichever pattern this is set to. So when we begin, pattern counter will be set to zero. Uh, so we're gonna run moving dots here. This jumps to our moving dots function uh, down here. And we're gonna run through this for, for one frame. So it's gonna run all of this code. It's gonna set our LEDs array to whatever our pattern should look like. Uh, and then it's gonna return back to our loop up here again. We then go to fastled.show and that writes out our LEDs array to our strip. And then of course our loop keeps repeating, um, so it's still zero, so we run moving dots again, then we go back to fastled.show, and it keeps running in a loop like this. Also in our loop, we have a function that repeats every five seconds, and this is gonna call next pattern. The next pattern function is very simple. Um, all it does is add one to pattern counter, this percent sign is just the modulo operator. What it does is it re returns the remainder when pattern counter plus one uh, is divided by three. Uh, what this means is that the pattern counter will loop, so it will go zero, one, two, zero, one, two, zero, etc. If you have four patterns to choose from instead of three, all we would do is change this number three to a number four, and it should work just the same. And that's it. Running simple patterns in functions is as easy as that. Uh, we can see that every five seconds, the patterns change as requested. And once it's got to the final pattern, uh, it starts again at pattern zero. This code should be easy to extend uh, for however many patterns you like. We might also want to change our patterns on a, a button press instead of automatically. And this is easy enough to do by adding a few things to our previous code. When using buttons with Arduino, I like to use a button library uh, to simplify setting things up. Uh, the one I've chosen here is one button, uh, but there are plenty of other libraries available like easy button and, and JC button. There are two main advantages of using a library like this. Uh, firstly, the library will deal with debouncing your inputs. So when you press a button, the contacts actually touch multiple times. So if we don't debounce the input, this will register as multiple button presses on the Arduino. We can do this ourselves in the code, uh, but why not just let a, a library do it for us? Secondly, these libraries often have additional functionality. For example, one button can detect long presses, uh, it can detect single and double clicks, uh, and that can be useful when controlling a program from a single button. To install one button, just go to the Arduino Library Manager, so that's Tools, Manage Libraries, and then search for one button, and just install it from there like you would with any other library. Now we have the library installed, uh, we just have to use it. Uh, for full instructions, uh, see the documentation linked in the description below. So first of all, we have to include the library, of course, and then we create a button object. I've imaginatively called this one button, uh, and the parameters in the constructor here are button pin, so which pin, uh, digital pin your button is connected to, um, whether the button is active low, so that is when it's being pressed, is it being pressed when it's connected to ground or is it being pressed when it's connected to VCC? And also, should we use the Arduino's internal pull-up resistor? Uh, in this case, we want to do that as it saves us from having to use an external resistor in our circuit. Speaking of the circuit, uh, this is how we can wire up our button. Simply connect one side of the button to uh, any digital pin. I've used uh, D3 here and just connect the other side to ground. This is what it looks like in real life. Here I've set it up on a breadboard, uh, but there's no reason why you can't just do this on stripboard or even just wiring things together in midair. Going back to our code, in the setup function, uh, we attach the function to be called whenever the button is clicked, as in a click is a press down and, and release of the button. Uh, in our case, all we're gonna do is attach our next pattern function, uh, and then this will work exactly the same as in our previous example. Finally, if you're using this particular button library, uh, in our main loop, we must call a button.tick. 
and this checks the button each time through the loop. If you forget to put this in here, your button won't work and you'll wonder why that's the case. And we're done. So now pressing the button cycles through the various patterns, just like we did with the timer in the previous example. So far, though, in all our examples, each pattern has changed abruptly from one to the next, and it would be much nicer if we could crossfade between them. So let's see how to do that next. For crossfading, let's go back to using a timer to keep our code as neat as possible. Um, I'll first try and explain the concept behind doing this. So instead of our normal LEDs array, we're actually going to set up three arrays here. We've got source one, source two, and output. Let's say that we have a pattern uh, writing to source one that's uh, green LEDs. And we have another pattern writing to source two that's blue LEDs. We're then going to use the blend function to blend between them. Now, there are many variations on the blend function. The one we're going to use here takes two input arrays, in our case, source one and source two, and an output array. The blend amount determines how much of source two ends up in the output. So at first, we just set blend to zero. That means that none of source two is being blended in, so the output is just source one. When we want to switch to another pattern, we slowly increase the blend amount, so more and more of source two gets added to the output until the blend amount is 255. At this point, we're only seeing source two at the output and we've successfully blended between patterns. Now we can do something sneaky. While source two is being shown, we can start a new pattern and write that to source one. In this case, uh, moving red LEDs. Now we can slowly change the blend amount back down to zero again uh, until we're only seeing source one at the output. Clearly, we can continue doing this at a blend between as many patterns as we like. Looking back at our code, there are a few changes here from our non-blending example. In our loop, you can see that we're always running a pattern on source one, and we're always running a pattern on source two uh, simultaneously on each loop. Um, as before, every five seconds, we call next pattern. Uh, but in this case, next pattern's a little bit more complicated than last time. First, we increase our pattern counter um, as before, and then we determine which source our new pattern should start writing to. Um, if we're currently showing source one, we want our new pattern in source two uh, and vice versa. We then change which source we're going to use for next time around this loop. Scrolling up a bit, then every 10 milliseconds, we change the blend amount variable um, either towards 255 or towards zero. Changing the number of milliseconds here will change the speed at which the pattern will blend. So lower is faster in this case. These if statements here say that if we reach zero or 255, depending on which direction we're going in, uh, we wait until the next time we have to change the pattern again, uh, and then we do it all over again. As you can see, this results in a smooth transition from one pattern to the next, crossfading between them every five seconds. Once we get to the end of the patterns, as before, the patterns start again at zero. Hopefully, even if you don't fully understand the code here, you can use it along with your own patterns to uh, crossfade like a, like a pro. If you want to use a button instead, that's no different to last time. And I've included example code in the GitHub link uh, showing you how to do that. You can see the example here. It doesn't really matter how quickly we press the button. We're crossfading nice and smoothly from one to the next. It does have to be said, though, there are disadvantages to crossfading this way. The first problem is that you will run out of RAM very quickly on smaller microcontrollers such as the Nano. Instead of a single LEDs array, of course, we have three now. So these take up three times the amount of memory that a single array would use. On the Nano, I can run about 180 LEDs uh, for this pattern before it runs out of memory. Uh, whereas if I do it without crossfading, I can run over 500 LEDs. You can, of course, get around this issue by using a micro with a much larger memory, for example, a Teensy or a ESP32 or ESP8266, something like that. The second issue is that during the crossfade, the micro is running both patterns simultaneously. This is fine for simple patterns like the ones demonstrated here, but can result in stuttering or slowdowns if the patterns contain a lot of calculations. This can be negated again by using a microcontroller with a faster CPU. The final thing to look at today is possibly the most complex, and that's using classes to isolate your patterns. As I mentioned earlier, I'm not an expert in this, so if I've made mistakes here, please do let me know in the, the comments. So first of all, why might you want to separate your patterns into classes? There are three main benefits to this. Firstly, it stops your code being overrun with global variables. Having too many of these can lead to hard to diagnose errors. Secondly, it keeps your code much neater as your projects get larger. It means it's easier to add more patterns or to edit the code. And most importantly, the patterns are only in RAM for as long as they're active. Once a pattern stops running, that memory is freed up for other patterns to use. So you can add more patterns or more complex patterns to your strip. But a sort of extreme example of this, uh, have a look at the code I've written for my LED mask, it should be linked above here. 
uh, you can see these patterns are all pretty complicated and there's nowhere to fit all of these patterns onto a nano without using uh, classes. There are disadvantages, however, uh, mainly that it can make the code harder to understand, especially for novices. And certain techniques such as crossfading require much more advanced understanding of C programming. We'll start by using a button to switch between patterns here. And we'll set everything up as before, but this time you can see that we have three more files present at the top. So we have to sort of hash include these files if we want the compiler to see them. So that's what we do just here. Looking at the first pattern, uh, moving dot dot uh, we begin by including the Arduino library, and then we create a class. I've called this moving dot. It's customary to use uppercase uh, for class names if you don't have to, if you don't want to. Then we have two sections, public and private. Anything in public can be called from outside the class. So in here, we have what's called the constructor, uh, which is called when this object is first created. Uh, in this case, we don't need to do anything here, so it's blank. Uh, and then we have a public function called run pattern. Uh, it needs to be public because we need to be able to call it from our main code. Private functions and variables uh, could only be accessed from inside this class, and we're not using any of them in this case. Below the class definition, I've defined the run pattern function. These two colons here means that this function is part of the moving dot class, and the pattern is the same as in the previous examples. If we were doing this properly, properly, uh, this function could be moved into its own .cpp file, uh, but it's not hugely important for now, so I'm just going to leave it in the header or the .h file. Now jump back to our main sketch, and we'll have a look at the loop. At first, we'll be calling run moving dot, because remember, pattern counter is going to be set to zero at first. So we jump down here to run moving dot, and we set a variable called is running uh, to true. We then create an object um, of type moving dot. I've imaginatively called it moving dot. And then while running is true, we're going to run the run pattern function of our moving dot object. When we press a button, a few things happen. So pressing the button is going to run next pattern here. That's going to call this function just down here. First of all, we set is running to false. This will cause this while loop to exit, so the pattern will stop. Once we're outside of the run moving dot function, the moving dot object is no longer what we call in scope. It's dereferenced. Um, it's a bit technical, but basically it means it frees up memory for other patterns to use. We then increase our pattern counter by one, which in this case is then going to start calling run rainbow beat. When we run rainbow beat, that's going to set is running back to true again. We're going to create an object of type rainbow beat. Uh, and then because is running is now true, it's going to start running rainbow beat dot run pattern. Now, in this example, we're not actually getting much benefit from using classes, uh, as each pattern only takes up a small amount of memory in the first place. In our final example, we'll go back to using a timer to switch patterns again, and we'll look at using some more complex patterns. Here, I have included the Fire 2012, uh, Pacifica, and Pride patterns. These are a lot more complex than the patterns we were looking at um, earlier on. Looking at the Fire pattern just here, uh, you can see that at the top we have our constructor, and we also have our run pattern function, and they're public because we need to be able to call those from outside of this class. We also have our file lib function and a few variables down here as well. Uh, and these are private. We don't need to be able to get to these from outside of this class. What that means is we can use the variable names cooling or sparking anywhere else in our, our code without causing conflict. So that's uh, pretty useful. Every 30 milliseconds, a fire loop is run, and fire loop is the function down here that does most of the calculations. Then we run check timer. And check timer here uh, just sees if we need to change patterns yet. And then finally, we call fastled.show. Pacifica is a more complex pattern. Uh, it uses four functions. You can see the functions there, they're all private, uh, and three palettes. None of these need to be accessed from outside of this class, so we've set them to private. Uh, if you want to have a look through this pattern code yourself, feel free. Uh, this one's a little bit beyond me. I don't quite understand exactly what this one's doing. There are some nice comments on, on there, and I'm sure you could figure it out uh, given enough time. So along with the pride pan, uh, this is what that looks like, changing every five seconds. In our case, as our code this time was much more complex, it makes sense to start splitting things up like this. We've reduced the overall RAM usage, as only one pattern is in RAM at a time, and made our code easier to edit and easier to add additional patterns to. And we also don't have a bunch of global variables kicking around uh, to confuse ourselves with. Now it's time for you to have a go and try some of these ideas yourself. As I said in the intro, what we've looked at here are just methods that have worked for me to solve these problems. There are doubtless more elegant ways of doing this uh, that I'm unaware of due to not being a programmer. Uh, and if that's the case and you'd like to link to other examples, please do post these in the comments and I'll add them to the description. That's all for now and I'll see you next time.